Good evening. Stand to your feet as we worship our King. The emblem of suffering 
welcome you tonight to our Good Friday service. Glad you're here. Welcome those of you online. It's an honor to be with you in your homes or wherever you are. I thought about this all day long today. It was Friday when Jesus was crucified. And I was very cognizant of the time today. So at nine o'clock a.m. this morning, I remembered that's the moment at 9 a.m. when the nails went through his hands and the nails went through his feet, 9 a.m. And Jesus was on the cross, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. And the Bible says at noon, and I, I, I saw the clock at noon today. At noon, the Bible says darkness covered the earth. And so for the next three hours, so Jesus was on the cross a total of six hours, but the next three hours, darkness just covered the face of the earth. And then it was one minute till three, and I just looked at the clock at home, and I thought, that's the moment. Right at three o'clock on that Friday afternoon, Jesus said, it is finished. And right at the three bells, that curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was rent in two from top to bottom. And now we have access to the Father. So I was really cognizant of time today because it was on Friday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., he was on the cross. We're going to look at this tonight big picture. So often on a Sunday morning, it's like the little pieces of the puzzle. We get this little piece and this little book and this little verse. Well, tonight we're going to show you the cover, the picture of the, of the puzzle. Look at the box top. And the box top tonight is our story. And in two different major chapters, in Luke chapter 22 and Luke chapter 23, we're going to give you the whole story tonight. Why Luke? Well, the reason we're going to use Luke is Luke actually wrote this in a sequential chronolo chronological order. He's the only gospel. Mark doesn't do that. Matthew doesn't do that. John doesn't do that. But Luke does. Luke writes the story in chronological order. And so tonight, we're going to look at the big picture in chronological order. Danita, let's, let's start with, unfortunately, Judas. Let's start with him. Okay, we're going to begin in Luke chapter 22. It says, now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the 12. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. And they were delighted and agreed to give him money he consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. What Luke does next is he tells us about the Last Supper. So think Thursday, think Thursday now, afternoon, Thursday evening, and it's the time for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would begin the Passover the next day on Friday afternoon. And so the disciples said to Jesus, where do you want us to go? Where are we supposed to prepare the Passover? And again, Jesus does what only Jesus can do. He says, when you enter into Jerusalem, you'll find a man carrying a large jar of water. Follow him, follow him to the house and tell him the teacher needs the guest room. And so I just love how Jesus can get away with things like that. And he goes into this major house and it's a big house, a beautiful house, spacious enough to house a guest room for Jesus and the disciples. And the Lord's Supper then is what you're very familiar with that we do every Sunday morning. But it's at that point where Jesus then takes the bread, he applies it to himself, takes the, ju the wine, applies it to his blood. And we're gonna do all of that in just a little bit at the very end of the service. But what happens after this 
is the disciples actually have a dispute and they begin to argue with each other over who was the greatest. I can only imagine how disappointed Jesus must have been. I mean, this is the ninth inning and it's two outs and Jesus is about to go to the cross and you guys are arguing over who's the greatest. He stops, gives them a lesson and says, you know what? I want you to serve with the heart of a ruler, but I want you to rule with the heart of a servant. Jesus says, this is what my kingdom is all about. No matter how great you are, you you are a servant. No matter how lowly your position is, you actually are royalty. And so we as believers then learn from this that we rule with the heart of a servant, but we serve with the heart of a ruler. And then we see about Simon. And Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. I've prayed for you, but you, Simon, when you turn back, I want you to strengthen your brothers. And then they leave, and Danita, get us to the Mount of Olives, the beautiful place that we've been to. We start in verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw away beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to them and strengthened, appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. So they leave the Mount of Olives. They come off that side of Jerusalem, the Eastern side of Jerusalem. And now he's gonna be arrested. So think Thursday late night. Not midnight, but seven, eight o'clock at night on that Thursday night. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who called himself Judas, one of the 12 was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you gonna betray the son of man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? One of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. I honestly think that Peter was trying to cut his head off. Mm. And I just think the guy ducked, I do. But Jesus answered no more of this. He touched the man's ear and he healed him. Let's continue to worship. How great thou art. challenge you to stand up with us and worship the King of Kings. How great you are, King Jesus, we get to worship you. How great you are, we get to remember what you've done for us. We thank you, Lord. We worship you. Sings my soul, my soul. 
Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! How great You are! How great You are! How great You are, are, Jesus! We worship You. now look at not necessarily Simon Peter's greatest moments. So Jesus taught His disciples a profound truth. And this is a truth that He desires to teach us as well. He said to His disciples, I only speak what I hear my Father saying. 
I only speak what I hear my Father saying. And so when Jesus and all the disciples were gathered together for the Last Supper, they were sitting there together and Jesus pronounced to Peter, this is exactly what I hear the Father saying. And he said, Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And you can imagine what was going on in Peter's mind at that time. Thinking, no, no, Lord. See, this wasn't someone that Jesus had just met. He didn't just meet him like last week or two weeks ago. This was Peter. This was the man who left his fishing net on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and, and said, I'm following you, Jesus. He was the man who Jesus said, put your nets on the other side of the boat and let them down. And we know what happened then. Fish. Thousands of fish filled the boat. It was incredible. Jesus watched, I'm sorry, Peter watched Jesus as he raised his mother-in-law up from being extremely ill. There was a little girl who had died and Jesus brought her back to life in front of Simon Peter. And then Jesus sees him walking on the water and he attempts himself to go out there and walk on the water with Jesus. This is the man that Jesus was talking to. And he says, you will deny me three times. So we can imagine what Peter was thinking when he watched as Jesus was arrested and he was taken to the high priest and to, to be tried. It says in the book of Luke that Peter followed from a distance as I assume other disciples were as well. But he stopped in the courtyard. And when he stopped there, he stopped where people had built a fire and he sat down with them. And as he sat there, a servant girl looked at him and she said, you were with Jesus. You were with Jesus. So number one, he said, no, I was, it wasn't me. A little later, the word says, a man came to Peter and said, you're one of, of them, one of the disciples. And he said, man, I am not adamantly. Third time, the word says an hour later. So this had been going on for a little while. A man looks at him and he says, I am certain that you have been with him, with Jesus, because you're a Galilean. And Jesus said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And so then Jesus, little distance away, we don't know for sure how far, he turns and he looks directly at Peter and catches his eyes. And at that moment, Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him, the Word says. And then the rooster crowed. What also says in Luke that he ran out of that courtyard and he wept bitterly. Luke's a physician. I don't know if you knew that or not. Dr. Luke, who wrote this gospel, very meticulous, very organized, very detailed, a scientist. And he wants to get the details right. And what he launches into right after the stories of Simon Peter's denial is the guards. He wants you to know about the guards. And for some reason, he goes into great detail in telling us that the guards blindfold Jesus mm -hmm. and they began to hit him, possibly with their staffs. Who hit you? Who hit you? Prophesy, prophesy. You can just imagine they're, the jeers, they're making fun of Jesus. You know, he could hear, hear things and know things, but right now he can't know anything. Of course, he knew everything. And Luke wants you to know about the brutality of the guards. Other gospels tell us about the crown of thorns that were rammed on his head and the blood just comes spilling down. 
Another gospel tells us about the guards spitting on Jesus. I can't even imagine what heaven is doing right now. I can't imagine what God had to do to Gabriel and Michael. Stand down, stand down. And Gabriel and Michael are going, just let me go. Five minutes, God, I'll wipe them all out. Just let me go. And God's going, no, this is the plan. But Luke wants you to know about the guards. The next section is this illegal trial. I didn't get this till I was in graduate school. So if you don't understand this, I wanna make this as simple, as clear as possible, because I didn't understand it either. Mm -hmm. But all night long now, all late Thursday night, in the middle of the night, like a ping pong ball, Jesus is going back and forth. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, to Pilate, to Pilate back to Herod, Herod back to Pilate. And so all night long, it's a totally illegal trial. You were not supposed to try people in the middle of the night. And so the chief priests and teachers of the law, first of all, come to Jesus and they said, tell us, are you the Messiah? They're trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus said, yep, I am. And they said, well, we don't need any further witnesses. We heard it out of his own mouth. And as they're carrying him away, Jesus said, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of God, the father. Now they're tearing their robes and pouring ashes and now they're really angry. Mm -hmm. So they bring then Jesus to Pilate. Why the Roman governor? Why would these Jewish people bring Jesus to the Roman authorities? Rome was in charge and Rome could instill capital punishment. The Jewish people could not. So they needed Pilate. Pilate had to sign the death certificate. There was no way they could kill Jesus without the Romans being involved. So Pilate then began to question Jesus. And Pilate asked the same question, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, said Jesus. Then Pilate announced back to the chief priests and teachers of the law, the Jewish people, he said, you know what? I see no reason to kill this guy. I'll punish him, but he's done nothing worth capital punishment. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea. It started in Galilee and it's come all the way here. So Pilate's like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. So Pilate then takes him to King Herod. Again, all night long, this is going on. And now King Herod, the Bible says, he and Pilate became friends that day. Up until that moment, they'd been enemies. But now Herod begins to make fun of Jesus. And Herod begins to taunt Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews, they ask? Herod and his soldiers, the Bible says, ridiculed him, mocked him. They dressed him in an elegant robe. They sent him back now to Pilate. That day, the Bible says, Pilate and Herod became the best of friends. Pilate called the chief priests back together again and said, guys, for a third time, I'm telling you, I've examined him three times and I don't get it, I don't get him but I see he's done nothing worth capital punishment. About this time, they're starting a riot. And the crowds are gaining energy and strength. It says the whole crowd shouted away with this man, release Barabbas, release, release Barabbas. And wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appeared to them one last time, but the crowds now were in a complete uproar. Crucify him, crucify him crucify him. Why, shouted Pilate, I find nothing in him. The Bible says in verse 23, but with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant them their request. He released Barabbas, who'd been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, and the one they asked for, and they surrendered Jesus to his will. Let's keep worshiping our great King together and catch the fullness of the story. You can remain seated as we reflect on the words of this song in light of the story that we just read in the scriptures. How deep the love of the Father. How deep the Father's love for us.
Now we turn our attention to the crucifixion. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon, who was on his way in from the country, and they put a cross on him, and they made him carry it behind Jesus. And two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be crucified. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, They do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And the people stood amazed, watching. And the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. And there was a written notice above him, which read, this is the King of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there, he hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and with us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? 
we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. So how did he die? It was the Persians who invented crucifixion. It was the Romans who perfected it. And it was a brutal way to die. Basically, you suffocated. It's asphyxiation. And so you're nailed to the cross and your feet have nails in them and, and you're, you're, you're pushing yourself up, excruciating pain. And you're taking a, a breath and then you're seeping back down into the cross. And you can't breathe. You push yourself back up. The strongest of men actually lasted almost three days. Brutal, brutal way to die. It's why in our story, they broke the legs of the other two criminals so they could get all three bodies off of the crucifixion, crucifixes before the Passover began. So Jesus was nailed to the cross at a place called the skull, Golgotha. And many of us in the room and many of you online, we, we've been there. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's an amazing place to be, to think about what all took place right there at that spot. Again, nine o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, Jesus on the cross, high noon, darkness over the face of the earth, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, it's no wonder that Jesus cries out in a loud voice. It's no wonder he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's no wonder that that veil in the temple was cut from top to bottom, very thick, huge, thick, just ripped in half. And Jesus, he dies. And the Bible is clear. The physician says he died. It's like your doctor with a death certificate. The physician said he's dead. He wasn't injured. He wasn't just badly wounded. He wasn't on injured reserve. The Bible says he died. And the Bible is clear about that so that no one would think he goes into the tomb and the dampness and the coolness of the air would somehow revive him and he'd be able to push away the stone, break the seal, and overpower two Roman legion officials. The Bible's clear, he died. Luke says he died. And then it tells us about his burial. Chapter 23, verse 50 says, Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decisions and actions. That would be the decisions of the chief priests and the counselors. He came from Judea, from the town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. So he was a good Jewish man, a believer. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus's body. Pilate said yes. And he took it down, he wrapped it in linen cloth, and he placed it in a tomb cut in the rock. Again, many of you have been there. It's an amazing place one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. They got to get all the bodies off in the afternoon before dark, before late sunset, before the Sabbath began. The women who'd come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how the body was laid in it. it gives you those details. So on Easter Sunday morning, you don't think, well, maybe the women went to the wrong tomb. Maybe they got lost. No, the Bible's clear. They saw it. They knew where he had been laid. Then they went home and they prepared spices and perfumes 
but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. You can remain seated. And as you're sitting, I encourage you to just behold, to look at the cross, to look at his face. crucified my Lord and were you there when they crucified my Lord oh sometimes it causes me to tremble tremble at you I tremble tremble so look at him look at him and worship and look at him look at him and fall before him look at him at him and worship and look at look at him and fall before him and tremble tremble when I look at you I tremble story like this, it's very easy for you to think you weren't there. It's 2,000 years ago, it's Jerusalem, it's Judea, different religious system, different political powers. It's very easy for us to go, that's a great story, but I'm not in the story. The, the question is, were you there? 
Actually, you were there. You absolutely were there. And it's the reason why Jesus went to the cross because you were there, your sin was there in him. Jesus on that cross took all the sins of the world, past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. And he goes to the cross and no wonder he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lana sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And many physicians believe that Jesus dies of a ruptured heart. His heart is ruptured with the sin of the world, your sin and my sin. Were you there? You bet. I was there, you were there, we were all there. And so here we are tonight, right in the center of this story. And you've honored him tonight. You've honored him by coming and worshiping. You've honored him by coming in online. You've honored it because you're right smack dab in the middle of the story. And if you don't get that, you've missed the whole point. It was your sin and my sin that put him on the cross. And it wasn't just that we put him on the cross, but he stayed. He stayed there. The one who spoke and there was light, the one who spoke and there was this and that and this and that, the one who created everything, by his powerful world, word, the world that holds together, he stayed on the cross for you and for me. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Were you there? Yeah, I was there. You were there. We were all there. And so in just a minute, we're going to dismiss you starting from the back. And we're, we've got tables in the back and we're gonna take of the loaf and the cup and we're gonna remember his body and remember his blood. But I want you to do two things tonight. First of all, I want you to remember what he did for you. He took your sin and he exchanged his blood and paid for your sins. And so we're so, so honored tonight for what Christ did for us. So we thank you, God. We thank you. Because your body paid, suffered, sacrificed. Your blood was shed to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But the second thing I want you to do, I want you to think about the fact that today we have a spiritual gift that they didn't have. You and I don't have to go to the temple three times a year and offer the turtle doves and pigeons the blood of that. We don't have to take our pet lamb. Can you imagine taking your pet lamb? No. You'd never make it. You'd you never do it. I'd have to do it. Okay. You'd never do it. <laughs> Danita would just let the lamb live till he died. So we would, we, you don't have to do that. You don't have to offer the blood of bulls and goats. You don't have to take a pilgrimage three times a year to the city of Jerusalem. What you and I have today is the veil was torn in half and the separation between the holy place and the holy of holies, we now enter and we have free access to go into there. It's incredible what we have. So as you take of the Lord's Supper tonight, but you be grateful, oh, so grateful for the body and the blood, but be grateful for the time and history in which you get to live. You get to have the Holy Spirit in you, and you get to have the Holy Spirit on you. You get to have the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living inside of you. That is amazing. So Luke chapter 22, verse 19 says this, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, everybody, I want you to know this is my body. And every time you do this, remember the sacrifice I made for you. Remember what I did. Do this in remembrance of me. And I want you to remember about the cup. Take the cup. And the cup now represents my blood. This is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood. And I am now going to, and he said this is on Thursday, and 
very next day on Friday, Friday afternoon, he pours out his blood for you and for me. You've honored the king by being here. You've honored the king with your worship and with your presence tonight. Now honor the king at his table. May you be dismissed. Those of you in the back, they'll lead you in the back. Be dismissed around this table. Lead us in prayer. Holy Father, we come to you. Thank you for your great sacrifice and giving your son Jesus to us. Our hearts are so grateful. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross. You were the perfect lamb of God. Thank you that you took up all of our infirmities, all of our weaknesses, our mental, emotional, physical weaknesses, and you carried all that. And and the sorrow that we have in this life, you carried it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you endured the piercing for all of our transgressions and the crushing for our iniquities and our sins and our generational sins. And thank you that by your stripes, we are healed and made whole. We praise you this evening. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. And yes, Lord, we believe your word that we are more than overcomers. And we have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so now we walk in that power. We thank you. There's no condemnation for us, those of us who are in Christ Jesus. May we walk in that truth. And we ask this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Remain seated and someone will come and dismiss you. But as we're seated and we're waiting, let's just pour out our thanksgiving to the Lord and thank Him for what He's done. Let's give Him our worship today. Yeah.
Minister before you. 